Um, yeah, so this is a pay per view of a continual learning um, scenario. Um, and I'll make that distinction like a little bit, but uh, in general, I've been kind of curious of sort of um, just wondering if the sort of problems that we're testing our dendrite models on, if those problems are just sort of good continual learning scenarios, um, if they're sort of testing for the things that we sort of hope to be uh, testing for. Um, and then after some uh, just very like light perusing around, I came across this scenario called Osaka and I thought it was kind of interesting and I've sort of changed my mind on it back and forth, but I decided I'll present it and then, you know, we can sort of talk about it and potentially also have a, a general discussion of, um, you know, are there potentially better continual learning uh, scenarios that we can be testing against, not just Osaka, but uh, are there other ones that maybe um, uh, that we know of so far? Um, let's see. So I have a hard time changing the slide. Okay. Yeah. So the Osaka stands for Online Fast Adaptation and Knowledge Accumulation. Um, so that's the, the, the title of the paper and the link is in the bottom right. Uh, this is a paper out of Element AI and, and Mila. So it offers both a general scenario for continual learning. So like an example, that would be task incremental or class incremental learning. It also offers an algorithm to train in this scenario that uh, does particularly well in this scenario uh, and beats out sort of other sort of similar kind of algorithms such as like mammal and animal and um, sort of other ones we're familiar with and ones that we're not familiar with. I'm not gonna go over number two. I'm not gonna go over the algorithm. Just, I'm just gonna go over the scenario because that's sort of where um, what I what I think would be um, sort of more fruitful to, to talk about continual is learning it, scenarios. Yeah. Is it one paper or it says the papers offered? So it, is it plural or singular? And that's meant to be singular. Sorry, the paper. Okay. It should say the paper. That's a good okay, question. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So high level, this is the the continual learning scenario. So in the scenario, you have a pre training phase that your model starts off in. Um, and then you have a continual learning phase in which you actually test the ability to continue to learn. So potentially in the, in the pre-training, you're not trying to do any kind of continual learning. You could, but it's just an arbitrary pre-training phase uh, on a fixed amount of data. Um, so, and then the continual learning phase, um, it's, a, it's a little, I'll go into a more depth, but one of the things that sort of marks it is that you can visit old tasks. Oftentimes in continual learning, you'll just sort of sequentially go down class zero, class one, class two, and you're never gonna revisit class zero, for instance. But this thing, you have the potential to visit old tasks. Um, and then it all, there's also an emphasis on out of distribution tasks. Um, so it's not just, you know, permuted, oh, let's see here. It's not just, um, you know, uh, seeing the same type of handwritten digit um, but potentially you could visit uh, images of an entirely different thing. Let's say like, and you know, you're continue learning on digits and then you can be con continue learning on an alphabet. So in that sense, you can visit uh, at a distribution task. And I'll give a more concrete example of that uh, later on. And then the third point- Hey, hey Michelangelo, this, this sounds yeah. uh, almost identical to kind of what I was uh, discussing on Monday. And then there's like a pre-training phase where you, learn the basic representations of the input domain, or you're allowed to learn the basic representation, and then you switch to more of a continual learning phase. Um, I was in and out Monday, so I don't know if I caught it, but what you just said, it sounds like it, yeah. Was that a paper that you had referenced? Or... No, no, this was uh, when we were talking about the gradient stuff on Monday. Oh, okay. Um, um... Okay, never mind. We could, we... Okay. Uh, anyway, this makes a lot of sense to me. Okay, cool. Um, let's see, uh, reports online. Oh yeah, so for the third point, one of the things that's also kind of interesting is that it reports the online average performance. So, um, you know, uh, that's just to say is that, uh, how to describe it? The, the effect of this is that you don't, you can actually forget about previous tasks if you actually haven't seen them, right? So if you sort of do well at the current tasks that you're looking at, um, but you're sort of forgetting about a task that you've seen like 10, 20, 100 tasks ago, that's perfectly fine. Um, the sort of presumption here is that, you know, you allow the model to forget about tasks that it's not really seeing as often. And if it does see it more often, then um, because you're reporting the average performance, it, ideally it should be doing well on the ones that it's seeing um, sort of more often than not. So I, so these are three things that I, all three things that I sort of like like about it and it sort of gives probably the the main kind of 
uh, the big, big, the big points of the scenario. Um, okay, so this is just sort of like pseudocode of what the um, of what the training looks like. It's sort of a repetition of what I said, but maybe just put a little bit more concrete. So right, the pre-training phase, um, you sort of have this notion of uh, context, uh, and I'll describe that a little bit more. But um, so in the pre-training phase, these contexts can sort of be um, they can effectively be IID. You can sort of think about this as like, you can either do supervised training or meta learning, but effectively you're just sort of doing um, some sort of supervised pre-training. Uh, for the continual learning, the context makes more of a difference. So you're actually gonna, the contexts are like this, this Markov, this, this Markov process, this Markov random process. Um, the, they're gonna be randomly sampled. Um, and then you're gonna sample data within that context. And that these targets will actually change for the given context. Um, this is another thing that will probably, probably be easier to explain a little bit later on. Um, you're going to measure the error, and then you're sort of going to accumulate the, the average error. Uh, and then you're going to train on that data and then sort of keep on repeating this for 10,000 steps or however many steps. So this is the general pseudo co code of it. Um, Good question. Yeah, um, the context. Is that like each each task has its own context? Um, or what the is context, the role? The context is a combination of the task. So let's say which images you're training on, like whether or not that's like 10 MNIST digits or like let's say 10 uh, uh, OmniGlot characters. Um, and then it's also the labels that are associated with those digits. So what's interesting about this, and I'm not sure exactly how I feel about this part of the about the scenario, the labels can change. So let's say label zero for MNIST uh, digit in a particular context may be labeled zero, or a digit zero could be labeled zero, or in another context, it could be labeled one or five or seven or something like that. So the labels can actually shuffle around for the images. And that's sort of inherent to the context uh, randomly assigned. Okay. Yeah. Wait, just to, to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. So the context is basically a pairing between like a certain type of data and like certain labels, right? It's not some sort of like, it's not the same as the conjure for dendrite stuff, right? This is this is um, like information yes. about the specific task scenario. Okay. Yeah, it's actually a good a good point. I should make that distinction. Yeah, it's not a vector. It's 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 the association of the of the data you're using in the labels. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Maybe is this one way to think about it? Like, you know, how you think about an object depends a lot on the context. If you're looking at a, you know, Porsche car and you have minivans and, you know, sedans and other cars nearby, you might say, oh, it's a sports car. But if you had Lamborghinis and uh, Ferraris and other things, then you might say, oh, it's a Porsche. Right? So oh, yeah. the exact label you give really depends on the global context in which you're operating. Yes, yes, that's a, that's actually a very good example. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Michael, Michael and is there a notion of a task somewhere in here or it's all just uh, different classes? There is a notion of a task. The, the task would be sort of which images you're actually using. Um, so like which 10 characters of Omni got you're using, which 10 characters of uh, MDIS, well, obviously there's only 10 digits, but are using 10 MNIST MD digits, uh, 10 fashion MNIST, uh, 10 OmniGot characters. That's sort of the task. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so which task to train on? So every single um, step in the continual learning phase, you decide whether or not you're gonna choose a new task, a new set of 10 classes. Um, and these are, you sort of decide whether or not you, you want to switch stochastically. So with probability one minus alpha, you'll switch. And alpha is going to be fairly, um, is going to be fairly high. So you're not really going to be switching super often. It's like 2% of the time you're going to switch uh, to a new set of 10 classes. Um, so the boundaries are unknown to the model. So the model is not going to be told, okay, now you're training on these set of 10 classes or anything like that. Um, so it's, we'll have to um, sort of uh, be able to infer that a task has been changed and it should be able to 
adapt its uh, outputs accordingly. Um, the target distribution is dependent on the sample context. So this is what I was talking about. The MNIST digits, um, not only may you change uh, data sets given the new context or change the 10 classes that you're um, training on given the new task, uh, but to the second point, the labels of those images may change given the sample context, right? So the MNIST digit zero may now be labeled one, for instance. Um, yeah, so there's that, there's that example that I keep on giving. Um, yeah, so, and then part of this too is that tasks can be revisited. So if you decide to go back to MNIST, um, there are only 10 digits in there and you're going to select all 10 of them uh, to train on. You'll assign labels to them and you'll be training on MNIST again. Um, and then you'll keep on going until you decide to switch to a new uh, a task and a new data set. So what's interesting about this is you're most likely gonna see one again uh, throughout your training, uh, as opposed to in other continued learning scenarios where you only may see the, the category of one uh, only once. Okay, so the, this is a little bit more granular of how the task switching works. So you can sort of start on the on the left side, say you're working with OmniGlot uh, with some probability uh, alpha, like 98%, you're gonna stay in OmniGlot. Um, okay, and then let's see here, or I should say you're gonna stay within the same 10 classes that you're working with uh, in OmniGlot. If you decide to switch to a different 10 classes, you're gonna choose OmniGlot 50% of the time. You're gonna choose Fashion MNIST 25% of the time, or you're gonna choose MNIST 25% of the time. So the consequence of this is that the pre-training phase, uh, and I should have been a bit more clear about this, the pre-training phase is done on OmniGlot. Um, and then the continual learning phase includes these new data sets, Fashion MNIST and MNIST. So the effectively 50% of the time you're gonna train on the stuff you pre-trained on, continual learning on the pre stuff you pre-trained on. And then 50% of the percent of the time, you're gonna see out of distribution uh, classes. Um, I can't is this all, is, go, ahead. go ahead, Jeff. No, you don't, first. Yeah, I was just trying to understand the motive. It seems a little confusing to me. Is This is all within the same context, right? And you're switching tasks here. Um, so the context defines the labels. When you switch tasks, you're also going to switch context. So it's sampling tasks slash context at continual learning time. Um, every step with 2% chance, you're going to switch to um, potentially a new data set and then a new set of 10 classes within that data set and a new set of labels within those 10 classes. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to understand the, the motivation for the distinction between tasks and context. It's still a little confusing. Okay, so context is just going to change the, for a, a given input, it could change the label associated with it. Yeah. Um, and task is switching the set of inputs and classes you're looking at at any particular time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and they sort of, uh, they sort of go hand in hand. Whenever you're, you're sampling a new task, you're also, you're sampling, um, you're, you're sampling, let's see here. You're also, you're also choosing a new context as well. So why don't they just say, you just switch in context and the context can change labels, but doesn't have to. Like why I introduced the word task? Yeah, well? why, why have this distinction? But it's, it seems a little, Unnecessarily yeah, I, complicated. Yeah, that's a good point. This is this this is probably my fault. They do use the word task and context in the paper, and that was honestly very confusing to me as well. Um, so it may actually just be easier just to say sampling context at continual learning time. Uh, I think that is. Um, I think that does sort of make make a lot more sense. Um, if anything, yeah. Maybe there's a subtle distinction to be made, but it is just sort of simpler to think about context. Yeah. So I have a question and, and I'm not following okay. all of this, Michelangelo, so I apologize for my 
the ignorance of my question. Um, but it seems it seems like what you're saying here is you've got this pre-training data. And then when you want to do yeah. more things, you have to you have to go spend fifty percent of the time on the pre-training data anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And isn't that sort of counter to the whole idea of continuous learning that I don't have to go back and retrain the stuff that I trained earlier to learn something new? I mean, isn't that the whole goal of continuous learning? Is <laughs> I don't have to retrain everything all the time? I don't think it's necessarily requiring that you have to go and, and retrain on it. I think it's more either just sort of making sure that um, that you're still able to learn on the stuff that you pre-trained on, that you just haven't thrown everything out of the window just to learn the new things. Well, but that's the whole point, isn't it? I mean, the whole point is I should be able to learn something at some point in the past and then learn some new things and not worry that I'm gonna forget the things I've learned in the past. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean- Oh, I see. So then why, are you, why do you have to re constantly retrain on them? Yeah. Why not just, you can yeah. retest on them, but why keep on retraining on them? I mean, obviously right. there's some, yes, right. I mean, there's some degradation that occurs um, you know, in our lives that we forget things, but there's things I've, that I remember that I haven't dealt with for months or years, and I still remember them. Not everything, some things I forget very quickly, but, but there's many things that I learned very well and I, and I don't have to go back and revisit them, you know? <laughs> it's like, um, so it just yeah. seems like this is a little bit sort of like, well, are they really doing continuous learning if you have to go back and retrain on the stuff earlier? It seems kind of the counter to the purpose of continuous learning. Yeah, at least fifty percent seems really high, right? Like even if it was like five percent or ten percent. Yeah, would, or maybe yeah. it was like I don't have to do it for a long period of time, but maybe I eventually go. I'll, it'll slightly decay, yeah. and I'll, my performance will decrease somewhat, but not completely. Yeah. You know. You know I yeah, this is a good uh, point. I haven't done skiing in several years, right? So, but, but, and so when I pick up skis again, I won't be maybe as good, but I'll still be able to ski. You know, it's not like I forgot the whole thing, right? I haven't, I haven't yeah. had to ski five percent of my time or fifty percent of my time since <laughs> I've ever skiing. So I mean, it just, I just, it's not. I'm not questioning you. I'm just questioning what the goal of the of the whole project here. Is. This not our project, but this. Yeah. Here. I, I, um, I'm just. Okay. Yeah, I'm curious. Is there algorithm? Does their algorithm use replay of some sort? To it get does not. The, no. It does not use replay. It does not use replay. Yeah. Because I'm just wondering, and maybe this is being me being overly suspicious. Is are they designing a benchmark? that's really designed to show off their algorithm. Yeah, um, yeah. that's a good <laughs> way to put it. The algorithm does really well on this and others don't. So I wonder if they're just creating yeah, but, some variation of existing things yeah, because it I'm, really yeah, exactly. highlights their particular algorithm. I'm looking, at the, I'm looking at these things on the right side of the screen here and says, that's an odd thing to choose. Why would they do it that way? You know, it's like, yeah. it's a, it's a good Okay, point. so I guess part, something that could help with this is I'll say that um, OmniGlot when it says 50%, it's somewhat misleading. So the pre-training phase is done on half the classes. Um, that's, I think it's done on like a thousand classes and then leaves about 600 something uh, that it hasn't seen. So it's actually, a the split is a little bit, it's closer to like 25, um, it's closer to like say 25% of the Omnigolite images or not 25%, what is it? Um, a, good, a good 600 out of 1600 classes you haven't seen before. So it's not entirely, you know, fifty percent of the time you're going to be seeing. Okay, that's that. that's true. Although, but it is. Still it's a little weird. bit better. It I is mean, yet. I mean, the way I would have thought you would have, I, if coming in naively to this, I would have said, okay, someone's going to do this pre-training on on the clock, whatever, all categories, mm -hmm. you know, from whatever, and then now you're going to start learning new tasks, fashion MNIST, and MNIST, whatever it is, and as you add these new tasks, you then you go back and test how well am I doing on the ones I learned earlier, and of course there'll be some degradation, but what is the percent of the degradation and it shouldn't be a lot. Um, yeah. And so, uh, and that would be the way I would go, like just plot out new tasks, add it, add it, add it, add it, add it, and you know, how, how bad are we forgetting other things? What's the capacity of the system? Um, so yeah. any, any sort of going back to relearning pre-training, even in the way you just said there, well, it'll be some new things and some not so new things. Well, it's still a little wonky, it seems to me. But, uh, yeah. So I, I'm, my observation, I, I guess, I'm not hearing that I, I got it this wrong, that I was, I was being naive about it. it no, it's a definitely a, yeah. yeah, sorry. No, that's fine. Okay. No, it's definitely a good, it's definitely a good critique. Um, and this is one of the things, let's see here. I think in the algorithm, I'm sorry, in the scenario, I think it overemphasizes the sort of testing 
the ability to sort of adapt quickly because the the labels are constantly changing. And I think this is potentially part of it is that it's not really sort of getting, you know, to a more fundamental core of say continuing learning where you're, you're testing mm -hmm. the ability to learn without forgetting. Um, and then towards Subutai's point about whether or not they actually made an algorithm just tailored for it. I don't think that's the case, considering that they titled the paper after the scenario and they explicitly say in the paper, you know, we hope that people come and beat it. We're just trying to set a bench line. So I think they are trying to like sort of propose something that is just a better scenario for people to be testing against. Well, or at I least think, that's what I hope. I mean, Subutai's yeah. comment was they might, have, they might have had an approach to continuous learning and this is how they tested it because it worked well. I mean, it's, it's not yeah, like maybe, could, yeah. You know, it's more like they came up with the algorithm first and then said, well, let's see what it's good at. And, I mean, we do the same thing, right? You know, our temporal memory algorithm, we, we came up with memory and then we, we tested on things we knew it would work on. We didn't test on things we didn't <laughs> it wouldn't work on. So, mm. um, uh, I mean, that, yeah. That's a good point. Um, okay, yeah. well, we keep going. I'm just, I just, we have to keep it in mind and we think about what our tasks are, what we want to do. Uh, I wouldn't yeah. expect this is how I'd go about it. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think the yeah the most important thing is is this just some really artificially constructed uh, set of rules, or is there some real uh, intuitive you know motivation for this? Are there application? You know, is this a practical scenario? Is this uh, you know is this a natural scenario that that you might an autonomous agent might encounter, or is there some underlying motivation that that somehow intuitive and appealing. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what's most important. Because it's got enough, it's got enough little wonky details you, you make, make me scratch my head like, oh, why did they do that? Why did they do that? Why did they do that? Um, yeah, so that actually transfer. Oh, wow, okay. I meant to have that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that's exactly the question. I guess we should have just waited a second. That's, yeah, exactly yeah. the question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, uh, I messed up the animations, but yeah, so I think there are some, starting with the first bullet point, I think there are some improvements over other continued learning scenarios. Uh, so like for instance, over class, uh, continued learning tasks and class incremental learning. Um, I like the fact there's a pre-training phase, there's an emphasis on out of distribution tasks compared to meta continual learning, um, say like OML and animal that we've working on, um, we've been working with. Uh, once again, there's an emphasis on out of, out of distribution tasks. Um, but, uh, Michael, Andrew, th that's not necessarily a it's not like the meta continual learning stuff couldn't be applied here. Um, you know, it's oh, just it that it's just that yeah. animal and OML did not do out of distribution tasks, but that same there at the animal and OML kind of objectives could still be used. Here. Yes, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, the pre trains yeah, you could apply them in the pre training phase and then test them in some sort of way that uses out of distribution tasks. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good okay. question. Um, yeah. the, the algorithm they suggest, so do they just use like a normal classification loss function on whatever subset of the data they're looking at? Um, I believe so. Let's see. Oh, in pre-training, they actually pre-trained with mammal. When it comes time for, um, when it comes time for the continual learning phrase, phase, uh, to be honest, I actually didn't really read their algorithm in much depth at all. I got enough just to know that they pre-trained with MAML, um, but, uh, but I didn't really go into their algorithm super well. But I do believe their loss function was effectively just cross entropy, but then they sort of strategically decide how they update that loss function, depending on whether or not they detect that the task has been changed. Okay, so they do have some sort of like um, incorporation of the task in, in the update. Um, not explicitly, right? They can't because you can never actually know what the task is there. Right. It's unknown, but mm -hmm. um, they do try to identify whether or not the task has changed, yeah. Okay, and cool. it's, so the task is not given as input, but the context is given as input? No, the context okay. isn't given as input either. The okay, reason neither. why they can, yeah, they, I think they sort of, in, sort of infer whether or not the task has changed is depending on how much like the loss function changes. It's something okay. that the effect of that change, like, uh, yeah. Um, like a heuristic based algorithm, not something that's learned. Heuristic based, yes. Although I don't know if the hyperparameters in that are learned. They may be, I'm not sure. I have a quick comment to the OOD. Um, even though M animal and OML 
they don't deal with all the tasks. I think we've seen before that the general direction in the meta learning community and even meta continuous learning is to deal with all this. So the last data set we reviewed, the meta data set that contain you know, uh, 10 different data sets into one. So that was mainly to deal with that and include some of the tasks during evaluation. So yes, it's an improvement over animal, but no, it's not an improvement or over you know other benchmarks that we've, we've oh, yeah. seen more recently. What did you say was the ten data sets in one? What was that example? I think it's called meta data set. We reviewed here at some point. Oh yeah, you mentioned that. Yeah. Oh okay. So that's like um, sort of taking it to an extreme where you have you made pre-trained on one data set, but now you have nine new ones that are out of distribution. I don't think that it's one nine. It's more like eight two. I think you pre-train on eight and then you see two during evaluation. But yes, that's the same idea. Oh okay, okay. Um, metadata set. So uh, just writing that down. Yeah, that's a good example of. Um, I'm trying to sit here. So okay, this is possibly good. So should we actually try it? Um, I'm not entirely sure. I think just as, as you mentioned, Lucas, there are other improvements in this realm as far as sort of testing against uh, OOD. And then there are still other things as far as, um, uh, you know, just sort of finding a scenario that really does sort of test continual learning in a, in, in a sort of faithful light. Uh, you know, for instance, as Jeff pointed out, not retraining on tasks, on pre-trained tasks uh, too often. Um, and things of that nature. So I guess I'm still kind of curious if, if we can actually find something better. Um, one thing I don't really know much about is reinforcement learning scenarios. Uh, I know Akash will do a presentation on the soon, so I'm sort of looking forward to that. I imagine there still can be pre-training. Um, oh, that should say OOD scenarios. I imagine the agent can be exposed to OOD scenarios. Um, and then you know, other benefits as well, such as multi-sensory learning, uh, imagine can be incorporated into it. Uh, obviously this list is not comprehensive, um, but yeah, I guess so, yeah. The, the, the point of this is just sort of like raise a conversation of, you know, what things I guess, you know, we would want and just sort of kind of continue that sort of conversation, um, sort of what we hope for in a, in a, in a good continual learning scenario. Um, but it's still, open-ended one way to think about it is what would be most impressive to people what would something that you know what kind of benchmark would you have where people would say yeah that gets to the heart of the matter that's you know you know just put a different spin on it think about what other people would think about it i mean mm -hmm. we want to we want to show that we can do something dramatic here and the question is uh what would be dramatic so the way we're thinking about this in the embedded ai project jeff is it's kind of similar. There are a lot of similarities to what Michael and just showed. So we're thinking about the pre-training phase, but the pre-training would be unsupervised as opposed to supervised. So it's just like the agent is thrown at the environment and it has some time to explore and it has to learn from that. And then after the pre-training, and we'd have a series of a few shot continual learning tasks. And then we want to know if you know we can have an agent learn a good model of the world during the pre-training phase uh, that can easily be extended for continual learning during the evaluation phase. That's, that's kind of the idea we are going for. Yeah. And I don't know, I think, I think it's, at least on my perspective, it's, it's a lot closer to how humans learn. Than yeah, uh, I'm just trying to think out what would that mean in, in other data sets or other kinds of problems? Um, you know, so it made sense when I, you talk about a, a robot exploring an environment. That sort of makes sense to me. I don't know, I don't know how that relates to other tasks. Well, I think what, what Lucas means is like, like from an agent's point of view, um, learning behavior doesn't always have to be like task oriented. It can just learn from like its own, uh, in quotes, curiosity to build like some sort of representation of the world and then use that representation when presented with specific tasks. Yeah, but how does that relate to these kind of uh, uh, character sets that uh, Michelangelo was just talking about? Oh, it's not. Yeah, like, so that's uh, what I'm saying. It's like, so I, it makes sense in that environment, but I'll just try to relate it to, okay, we're gonna use the same 
if I was going to show continuous learning on the data sets that Michelangelo was just talking about, what mm -hmm. what would you know? How did that strategy relate to that? I mean, did that? I just I don't know. I, I don't I don't really have like good thoughts about this. I'm just asking questions. I think we can apply the same idea to uh, just regular supervised learning. Uh, I think one of the key aspects here is that I think the pre-training should be unsupervised. And that makes- I, I agree. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking too, Lucas. Exactly. So yeah, so in this case, it's still supervised, right? So we still have to tweak that to make it unsupervised. And, and then it would be a very, very direct analogy to the, the agent scenario is there's just an unsupervised phase where you may be using prediction or some curiosity or some other mechanisms to learn about the domain and then you switch to a more so what would be the simple. domain if i'm looking at these sort of character data sets this omni glob stuff and so on i mean is it you know it's like it's i can imagine a robot running around the house and saying okay i got unsupervised learning about the house or something like that i don't know but what is, what's the equivalent here? <laughs> no. It'd just be images. It'd be images and you could anything. use- you Images know. of anything or images well, of characters or just images Well, ideally any... images of anything, I think. And then, <laughs> I mean, yeah. just like we're, we, we can, we're trained on high resolution images, but we can still do MNIST. Uh, so we might as well, we, in reality, I think it should just train on images. Mm -hmm. And then a very, very constrained subset of that could be MNIST. <laughs> But yeah. the, the real thing is to, to understand the domain of images. Interesting. Okay, so then, I mean, then you'd really maybe, yeah, you'd want to move away from the whole thought. Then, then you move away from the whole thought, like, oh, we're training, pre-existing training on this Omnigod data set, now we're going to look at, you know, um, MNIST or something like that. It's, this is more like, hey, here's the world, here's real world images, and that's what we're going to train on. And now we're going to look at some subset of the real world, which might be, Character sets, or might be cats, or something like that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. It sort of begs the question for me, Michelangelo. Like, what exactly is Osaka? Is it is it this sort of general idea of you know context and tasks and how you measure stuff and sort of an evaluation framework in a scenario, or are they specifically saying kind of like Jeff was saying? You know, you have Omniglot and Fashion MNIST and MNIST, and you have to evaluate on that data set. Um, and that is Osaka is that set of data sets and a set of results on that. Or is it even more like it, there's a code base that you have to run with very specific data sets and it gives you the, uh, the, the result. What exactly is Osaka? <laughs> it's, a, it's the first one. It's the, it's the general, it's a general continual learning scenario. So I gave MNIST and Fashion MNIST Omniglot as an example, but um, they also had other data sets uh, as an example. So for instance, they even had uh, tiered image net, right? Where image net is split up into broader categories. And then those broader categories are used to define um, sort of a uh, outer distribution task. But then if, if it's not, if it doesn't specifically say you have to use these data sets and how do you compare different algorithms? Um, and every paper could use its own set of data sets. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I guess the, um, I mean, I think the, the paper is general. I don't know exactly. Yeah, if you wanted to sort of test against theirs, then yeah, I think you'd have to, it, it, yeah, like there would have to be some kind of standardization of the of the data sets that of the data sets that you use. But um, I don't see why you couldn't necessarily adjust things if you really wanted to, um, yeah. and then you know test against theirs, but then also say, okay, well, this this is more realistic learning scenario. So I'm going to try it here and then see how well things do. Yeah. It seems like if you want to have a competitive benchmark, the things you want to test against, uh, you'd want to specify the additional um, data sets to be learned after, you know, th that someone could treat pre-train their system on anything. It, you know, it, that's up to them. You know, you can use images, you can use this set of images, you can do whatever you want. But now, the, 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 now you want to see the performance of the system as it's learning new things one after another and how well it remembers them and that seems like you'd have to specify what those are that you couldn't compare them yeah. yeah even like the metric i think you mentioned earlier the metric is some sort of a moving average of recently seen stuff yes right. and you know do they specify okay what is the coefficient of the moving average you know what is <laughs> oh, it's not a moving. Like a huge, 
you know, it's a huge effort. They could make a huge difference. Or is it a window of time? You know, what is that window? Uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's just average over all the time steps. So if you get like 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.5, whatever, you know, whatever the 10,000 steps is, it's just average. You just add those up and then average it over 10,000. So it's always uh, 10,000? Oh, just however number of steps that you that you do continue learning for, and the and their work they did ten thousand. Okay, but again, if you're comparing different things, that number could make a tremendous difference in the accuracies. Right. Um, well, the, it's just the average. Um, so, but it has. It, but was, you said, it, didn't you say it was only the recently seen stuff? And if you haven't seen anything for a while, it's okay to forget it. Um. Let's see. Are you talking about? Yes, that like, is true. I, yeah. 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 So what is recent? Yeah. Um, I think too many I questions. Question. Too many. Too yeah, many I, questions. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. But I don't no, mean to. No, no, I'm not, I'm not saying you're asking too many questions. <laughs> I'm saying that the specification as it's been presented leaves too many unopened, unanswered exactly, yeah, questions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm not critiquing you, Michael. <laughs> I'm just <gonna> asking. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, this is good. So I guess, I don't know, let's see here. Um, yeah, can I, let me ask a broader question. So I, I haven't been following all this. So again, my apologies, but I mean, mm -hmm. are we looking for benchmarks to test continuing learning algorithms for? Is that what we're looking for right now? Is that what this paper today was about? It, it seems like there, there's like every paper or every other paper seems to have, have its own definition of continuous learning and, hmm. and the benchmark. I think that's, there's so many ways that it, continued learning can be evaluated. It's really confusing. And yeah, we, we would like to find something that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. maybe we have to come up with our own. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. Like, it'd be like, you come up with your own, but that's a shame because if someone else already did it, you'd really want to do that. You just yeah. want to be adding onto the pile. Although just yeah. looking at this one today, this seems like a very specific kind of weird one. I don't know, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, so why is it like this? And I can easily imagine, I was doing a moment ago, just imagine like what would be a more general purpose or more generic mm -hmm. sort of one. And you'd think some other people would have thought about this already and come up with some other proposals. Um, they have, um, the problem is there are too many other people who've thought about it and come up with proposals. <laughs> but, but are any of them good? I mean, you know. You know I think like, wanna, there's a pretty good case from the paper I read about how reinforcement learning is a good framework because they're like in, in supervised learning, there's no notion of like an agent's past or future. It's just like the data in front of it at the moment. Whereas mm -hmm. in reinforcement learning, like just the objective itself has it within it baked, like the agent's lifelong future and its past. So like in order to act optimally, it has to optimize something that already like accounts for that. Yeah, but, that, but that's not, that, that's not really, I mean, that's just suggesting what kind of benchmarks you might come up with, right? It, it doesn't tell us what the benchmark is. You might say well, that. The, the, there are benchmarks within reinforcement learning that kind of get at that. So, those, and, and you'll good. talk about that, you'll talk about that next week. Right? Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I think that can be put in within the framework of embodied AI pretty, pretty mm -hmm. handily as well. So, so you're suggesting there might be good benchmarks we could use in the reinforcement learning world. Yeah. But it might require like, like I don't know if like things like animal or something will like just work out of the box and reinforcement learning because it's like a different learning paradigm itself. Yeah. So one of the things I wanted, I thought would be interesting to have is a place to test the dendrites necessarily. I'm not necessarily looking for something to test animal or OML or meta continuum learning, but the dendrites work in, been been working on um, find a good sort of a a, a, a good application for that. A good testing yeah. scenario for that. And this might be reasonable. Just have to think through it and come to terms with the wonkiness of it, I guess. Uh, but I, but I like the idea of there being a pre-training phase and just echoing what Lucas said. Um, it, ideally, that would be unsupervised, but I like the idea of there being a pre-training phase. Uh, the fact that there's different contexts associated with, I think that seems pretty nice as well. But it's just, there are a few weird things here. Yeah, there are a few weird things. Um, personally, I am like leaning against not trying it. Um, partially also because there are so many, like uh, as we talked about, there are so many kind of continual learning scenarios. It's sort of very difficult to actually test 
like uh, sort of rigorously because then you're sort of having to kind of like test actually across many scenarios and it's sort of just to sort of be very uh, rigorous. Um, and it just seems it's almost, almost a headache just to do, introduce like a new one just to have to like test against. Uh, mm-hmm. So I kind of like the idea of sort of departing from it and then kind of just, you know, say like leaving continual learning sort of off to the side and like the scenarios that they propose and actually just trying something entirely different out of reinforcement learning. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty curious to see the, the scenarios that Akash sort of presents um, later. And Michael, yeah. we, we have been discussing like ways of applying dendrites in the reinforcement learning. I mean, Akash came up with a few ideas we've done as well. So, I mean, we're okay. not talking in the research meetings, but if you want to join the discussions, yeah, you're more than welcome. But yeah, we've, we've been thinking about that as well. Okay. I mean, I can come up with a completely different objective, which is kind of training speed. It, it's the, like, you know, the real power of continued learning, you could argue, is that you can really quickly learn new things without you know, seeing this you know, huge batch of stuff over and over again. So you know, another metric could be, as you're learning new stuff, um, you know, how quickly can you get to the accuracy as if you had seen the entire dat- data set over and over again? You know, how fast can you learn stuff? And we know humans can learn extremely fast. So this is a little bit like few shot learning, but um, in a continually learning scenario. Right? It's just, you should be able, and that's a, that has tremendous practical applicability. You yeah, have large that, production networks and you want to update it with some new data. You don't want to retrain the entire thing. That's huge energy uh, usage. Just how fast can you do that? I think it's a good idea. I think, I mean, you're coming up with the, you know, what is the, the real metric we're trying to optimize here? Um, and I think it's important to state it. That's a good one. It's one that's at least commercially valuable. Yeah. Like so that. Lucas, yeah. No, go ahead. No, I was going to ask you if you knew any scenarios that are like that. Like in reinforcement learning or like regular? Um... Just the one that uh, Subutai described, the, the training speed. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what we're thinking about. No, I don't know like one on top of my head. We, we, we're thinking about a benchmark that goes on that line. I actually had a question to Subutai about that. So, Subutai, do you think it would be more important to fix a budget for like uh, for, for few shot learning and then see um, how much reward you can get within that budget? Or is it more important to fix a reward? So this reward means solving the test and then see how long do you take to get to that reward. Is, that, is the difference clear? Like one is fixing the budget and measuring the reward or it's, it's fixing the reward and measuring the budget. Yeah, it's a good point. I, yeah, I think it, those are the two dimensions, like how much time you spend and how much accuracy do you get? What is the overall accuracy? Um, yeah, but you have to fix yeah. one of them, right? To evaluate, like to create create a benchmark, you have to fix one of them and measure the other. Yeah, I mean, in a practical scenario, you probably you you there's some accuracy you have to hit. So you probably want to see, okay, how quickly can you hit the desired accuracy, Something like that. All right. Okay, that makes more sense in like reinforcement learning scenarios. That's how usually it's evaluated as well. Like you have this human performance baseline usually, and then you want to know how many episodes you need to get to that human performance. Mm-hmm. Could, could you also add another dimension is the compactness of the representation? That can be added, but do you mean optimize for just like added as in looking at it? Right, but I mean, uh, it's it's kind of, t- in some ways, it's it's kind of like the, uh, uh, the 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 learning time performance, but the compactness, in yeah. some sense, is that you're looking at say how much have we been able to consolidate these things to some common representation that is useful carrying forward, as opposed to just leaving a trail de treatise behind you of of things that have tried and gone. yeah, and and that's that, that's also very practical. And, and commercially valuable, and, you know, you could say not just what's important is not the number of training iterations, but the amount of energy you use to get to a certain accuracy, or right. the um, number of flops you use to get to a certain accuracy. Um, 
yeah um but I, i'm just i'm just thinking if there's something uh intrinsic in in a in in, in compact representation for these things not just not just the fact that economically it's better, but there's something intrinsically interesting in in the compactness of the representation. It seems like well, if, you, if you mean sparsity, then yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. In effect. Yeah. It seems like you're talking about two different metrics, right? Sometimes talking about flops, and I think Kevin's talking about the like effectiveness of the, the amount of information that the learned representations carry. Which is really hard to measure, but of course it's super interesting. Yeah, I, I guess I'm I'm trying to look at something where it it's it's tending toward to the degree that uh, the uh, model uh, gets to some being able to generalize as opposed to particularize for these various cases. I mean, that kind of is, when I think of how I consolidate memories and, and various other things, eventually things winnow down to more compact representation that becomes useful in a lot of contexts as opposed to remembering very discrete individual uh, uh, tricks or something like that. But, but wouldn't the, that be incorporated in, if here we're allowing auto distribution samples and we're measuring overall accuracy, wouldn't that subsume what you're talking about? Then maybe it has to be more compact in order to better do better on auto distribution samples. Well, yeah, it, may, it might be it might be derivative of it. Uh, uh, it. It's it's just that when you said two dimensions, this was another aspect of it that that kind of struck me as being uh, a worthy goal. Mm -hmm. 